Hey there, MCW faithful. You already know what time it is. Every Tuesday night at 8, another insightful and exciting edition of the MCW cast. I'm Legacy, MCW announcer Larry Legend. I'm MCW promoter Dan McDevitt. And I'm Tara. Welcome to the cast. Thank you for joining us tonight and checking out our uh, podcast, whether you're watching the video on Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube, or you're listening as you go about your business on wherever you get your podcast content from apple podcast google play soundcloud spotify stitcher pocket cast breaker radio public or cast box so thank you for joining us and uh, we're glad you're here absolutely hey i want to give a huge shout out to each and every one of our followers on at mcw cast 2021 every little bit helps and i'm proud to announce that we have broken a hundred followers Woo-hoo. all right haven't even been out for a whole year and every single episode we talk about our interaction with the people of twitter but you know mcw pro has so many followers i'm sure a lot of the folks are like i'll get my news from mcw pros twitter but we love that you've all shown us a little bit of love and support via the avenue of tw- twitter so thank you now did anyone answer your question that you threw out two weeks ago no one answered <gasps> my trivia question wow. and that's okay because, okay. you know, we got to kind of test these things out, but I'd, I'd be happy to to reveal the answer uh, if, for any inquiring minds out there. Uh, since no one answered, okay. the question, again, to reiterate is, name two individuals who have been involved in every episode of the MCW cast since our iteration. Now, one of those people is sitting <laughs> right across the table from me because with a solid gold track record of perfect attendance, Tara has never missed a date behind that microphone right here in the studio. (laughs) So from everyone here, a round of applause for you, Tara, for being a part of every edition of this cast and in honor and memory of our friend, Bruiser. Uh, But the other person is also something that someone that's kind of near and dear to our role in Uh the world of professional wrestling, MCW announcer, Danny Mays. Leaning, lending his vocals oh, to the commercial. Right, right. Question. I know it was, but there's actually another answer. So, because we talked about this off the air last week, remember we were talking about who was the answer, and there's somebody else who's been here, but behind the scenes. Ah, absolutely. Who we, has not missed an episode? We couldn't get it done without a director. That's right. Uh, so, so <laughs> our director as well, Steve Diaz, has been a part of every single episode of the MCW cast. But yeah, it was a trick, mm-hmm. and that was what I was trying to pull out of yeah. our fans. It's like, oh, when you never you said know. That I was like, I. N- I never even asked you, but I was like, I have no idea where he's going. <laughs> well, he's that. been doing the commercial voiceover from day one. I knew I was one of them, yeah. I, so I knew that. But uh, yeah, remember we were all bundled up in here when we first uh, <laughs> came in here. I remember that those first original it's episodes chilly. It was so chilly. It's yeah, chilly. yeah, and and we went through spring and summer, and we're almost all the way back in winter. So it's <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, and it's also uh, it's also an honor to be doing this and to be gathered together in particular on this night because Mm -hmm. this is the uh one year anniversary of the day that we lost our friend the bruiser um Mm -hmm. so hard to believe it's been it it, yeah it really well you know what makes it it hard hard to to believe believe is that um we keep him alive through this so Mm -hmm. like there's not a week that goes by that i don't look at those initials rjm Mm -hmm. there's not a week that goes by that i don't see him in some capacity around me and you know there's an old saying i don't know esoteric you know call me a hippie but no one ever really dies when you keep their legacy alive and yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where some days like i feel his absence acutely you know where it just seems like this big wall that's in front of you and you can't get around it and then there's other days where it's like oh okay he's just not at this show but he'll be here later yeah you know like you still kind of feel like that he's going to walk through the door or you know and then you stop and think oh my gosh it's been a year like are you kidding me and then i think well wait a minute we were shut down for a year so when's the last time he was in an mcw ring oh my gosh like i can tell you it was you know the end whatever february 27th or something 2019 was the last time um, you know, that he was, well, we had Hollywood that weekend too. The next, we had Hollywood in March, 2019. Uh, yeah. It was, uh, the day, two days before he got diagnosed, but he couldn't actually perform, but that was the last time he was technically in a ring. So I started thinking about that. And I'm like, wow, how is it possible? Almost two years has gone by. Like this yeah. is crazy. 
But same, yeah, same with me and just feeling his presence in the backstage mm-hmm. area. But Dan, I know you can you can relate to this. And Tara, you too. We've been doing all these shows, the Autumn Armageddon tour, and I got to tell you, there have been so many locker room leaders that have stepped up. Yeah. That I hear their voices and I hear <clears throat> RJ's voice. I hear his direction mm-hmm. coming through. I'm not going to call them out because it's our business, you know. But backstage, I just have been noting like, wow. That, that sounded just like RJ yeah. or, you know, this guy, this guy's stepping up just like, you know, when we were out, right. in, uh, you know, for the con- uh, the convention and having to tear down and set up yeah. real quick in between that. So, uh, yeah, you know, RJ's still with us. And that's the reason that we're gathered here uh, for another edition of the MCW cast and a great guest as well that we have. Uh, this was filmed before the Shane Shamrock mm-hmm. Memorial Cup. And one of our, our guests that we or one of our competitors that we welcome back was legendary WCW WWE TNA Impact star Shannon Moore. And that's who's going to be our guest for this edition of the MCW cast. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the MCW Cast. At MCW Pro Wrestling, much like many small businesses throughout the country, the pandemic has presented many challenges. For a company like ours that hosts events with live audiences, the impact has been even more severe, and all of our forms of revenue have been cut off. In order to continue to engage with our fans on a regular basis, we made the decision to begin to produce the MCW Cast and are providing it for absolutely no cost on Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube, and SoundCloud. If you'd like to support us during these challenging times, you can do so in several ways. The most popular way is to buy us a coffee to help fuel the cast. Just go to buymeacoffee.com backslash mcwcast, and for just $3, you can buy the cast a coffee, or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just $5 a month and receive several special perks. That's buymeacoffee.com backslash mcwcast. You can also contribute directly on Cash App, MCW Wrestling or on Venmo, MCW-Wrestling. You can also show your support for the MCW cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com backslash stores backslash MCW cast to pick up a full line of official MCW cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to t-shirts and sweatshirts. Also, don't forget to comment in the threads on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch to get your questions answered on a future episode And you can also send us a tweet using the hashtag AskMCWCast. Thank you for your support. And now, back to the show. And we are back here live in studio with our very special guest, Shannon Moore. Shannon, welcome to the MCW Cast. Hey, guys. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, Man, it's been a great trip today coming from Tampa so far. I'm looking forward to it, man. I've been looking forward to this for a while. It's been a, it's been how long since you've been with us? Right? Yeah, so like welcome back. Years? Twenty yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been a minute. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's that thing. Is you know I've I've been watching from a distance. You know, like yeah. MCW. You know, especially pre-COVID. Um, MCW is just one of those places that you always call home and that you're rooting for. And it's like even though I haven't been here, it's like I've been keeping my eyes on it. Yeah. And um, you know, as you know, Matt and Jeff, like they did right. some things with you over the past few years, and it's mm-hmm. like. You know, MCW, man, like you guys kill it here and it's just, it's great to be part of it. Yeah, man. We just, we just try to keep plugging along and just try to put out good product and, you know, so. Well, it's the passion. Yeah. You can just, whenever you, you hear about the MCW product, whenever you see the MCW product, like there's just passion driven. Yeah. And just a little things too, like just talking about the studio, like coming into your studio now, it's like, wow, like. This is a studio. It's not just somebody's bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Podcast, right? I, my yeah. favorite is like the basement where you can tell it's someone's basement or their mom's basement. It's got like the sheet up in the background, you know, to yeah. like make it look less basement-y, but you know that's what it is. Right, right. <laughs> and I mean, that's I, what it's, you know, for the passion is really, you know, I mean, Tara and Larry, they've been here all since the beginning in the late yep. 1990s with me. And now, I mean, it's hard to, like when we first met, um, and like Matt and Jeff started doing stuff. I was in my twenties. Now I'm pushing 50, <laughs> Right. you know, and, and, and I have like friends and, you know, I, I do real estate and offer a living and people my age are a little bit older. A lot of t- they'll hear like about and see me posting on Facebook and then a lot like, man, you do that wrestling stuff. And then some, they'll come to a show and then they'll be like, then, that, man, I see why you do that. It's pretty cool. You know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it's just, um, definitely the, the passion i guess is why we're all still kind of here yeah I, it's amazing man like you did good with mcw like just it's a brand like yeah. it's not just another indie show um and like that 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 word can kind of be gross too 
Um, yeah. I, I feel like like whenever somebody wants to label something as oh, it's just an indie show and it's like, no, it's not just an indie show. Like these shows are passion driven, especially MCW. But, you know, a lot of people don't understand like what it takes to actually put on not just a product, but a good product or build right. a brand. And like that's something you've did over the years. It's been great to be part of and watch. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things you hear too when people. I mean, if I had to sit and break down the hours, I mean, we all probably put in to do this because all of us have <laughs> you know shoot jobs. So you know what I mean to pay our mortgages mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, um, but it's one of those things you hear like when you're when you love something so much you're not working. You know, so yeah. it doesn't. I mean, but. I, gosh, I must, I mean, we all probably put in an extra full-time job every week. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Doing this stuff, but yeah, you know, but hey, it's, um, we get to get up and, and do something and be a part of something, and, you know, a, a lot, lot of our, watch a lot of our kids come up and had a lot of opportunity. And that's what you're hitting on right yeah. there. Over the past 23 years, we've all become family. Yeah. So it's not just that we're doing this thing that we love and that we're passionate about. We're family, we're connected, and just to, you know, tie a button on it, that's the reason we even have the MCW cast, because we lost a member of our family in the Bruiser, and we wanted to do something in honor of him, speak to the MCW faithful, to have great guests on like you. So uh, the camaraderie, the family, the passion is what has kept us going for all these years. Yeah. And back to your your beginnings, you you started right. You started with Matt and Jeff. Did you start yeah, in Omega? Man. Yeah. You... Well, not in Omega. We started in, on a trampoline. Like that was part of the whole trampoline deal with them. Um, you yeah, know, you I were part like, of that. Mm-hmm. Matt I was and Jeff. Like eight years old. Um, I weighed like forty eight <laughs> pounds. Right. Um, yeah. And like me and Jeff, like we you know we were best friends just through school, uh, elementary, middle school, that whole deal. And then, um, you know, like next thing you know, like the trampolines in the back, because they obviously they had. They were able to provide a trampoline. Like you know, my family wasn't too wealthy, so it was like his dad. Like they had a trampoline and they turned it into the ring, and we started filming, man. And I was uh, that was my first, I guess, introduction to actually trying to do this thing called, at that time, trampoline wrestling, not pro wrestling, but right. Um, it evolved from there. Yeah. Yeah, how I, I was I was never into the trample. We just we brought garden hoses around. We, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we, didn't, know, we didn't we didn't have, we didn't. I, you guys were ahead of us. You guys were ahead of, <laughs> ahead of the times. When I was a kid, we just wrapped garden hoses around trees. Well, trampoline wrestling is still going strong. Yeah, there's lots of channels on YouTube. Um, our the the kids, the next generation, all of our kids have made a little federation of their own. It's called RKW. It's called Random Kids Wrestling. But they got a lot of their inspiration from watching some of these old trampoline matches. And so they've got their own. They've got segments and backstage segments. They've got their own merchandise. But they do all that same stuff. And they, they use one of our crash pads. And, you know, they it's and it's cool because it's like from ages like five to like 15. And they all just come together like they're out there plotting right now, you know, and it's really neat. But the trampoline stuff really was a source of inspiration for a lot of what they do too well, that's what it's about yeah and like you know whenever i think back like you know i was a, a hulk hogan fan you know like everybody probably uh from the get-go and like ultimate warrior and like you see these things on tv and you know like then we start trying to do that ourselves like whether it's on a trampoline or whatever ring around the trees that you right. have built um but that's where it starts man like the love of this business and it starts there it starts with watching and then wanting to recreate it in your way and then before you know it like you end up you know with a real wrestling ring in your backyard or you're like dipping your toes into the professional part of it and actually trying to learn the business um and you know like it's great like that's that excites me to hear that kids are doing that just because like that's you never know like that's mm-hmm. your next stars right there like yeah. out of yep. those kids that group of kids and when yeah. were you guys when you started doing the trampolines, did you did you guys all break into the indies together or Yeah. Is that is that kinda what happened now? You started doing the trampolines and then you guys I guess the Carolina Indies? Yeah, like we had our crew. Um, you know, we were a tight crew. It was, you know, at the beginning, um, it was me, Matt, Jeff, Joey Abs, J- his name right. Jason Art, um, Champagne. Jerry I remember Champagne, yeah. yeah. Um, Black Skull, this guy named Scott Matthews. Like we we had such a tight group and we traveled like we we were inseparable like we didn't split off and go do our own shows it was like we rolled in as a crew right and i think that at that time like that was one of the strong impacts about our crew was like we would go out there and like we could all rip it up we could all you know wrestle and we would come in all together and then it was i don't want to say like it took over a show but 
by the end of the show, it's like, it was, you know, like, ah, that Cameron crew, like they come in and, you know, they killed it. Like, and then before you know it, like I'd be cruiserweight champion or Matt would be, you know, they'd be tag team champions. And it's like, our crew would be all over the shows. Um, so it was cool. It was just, you know, we, we had a tight group and like, we, we had each other's backs and it just went from there. And you, um, you, you, you ended up in WCW. Yeah. When was that you ended up in WCW? I uh, signed with WCW right at the beginning of 99, I think. Um, and how that happened, I was doing Music City Wrestling for Bill Barings and Burt Price. Right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And um, I was going out there. Like, my senior year, I missed, like, 75 days of school. Um, but they were cool <laughs> with it, yeah. You were wrestling. Yeah, I was wrestling. Like, I was so busy wrestling because I was going out there and, like, just traveling all over, um, you know, and all that, I call them my elders, but you know, I was raised by the boys basically cause I was so young. Um, they would try to rush me back to get me to school, but a lot of times <laughs> it just didn't happen because I was, you know, I was on the road and, um, yeah, but the principal, they were cool with it because, uh, you know, I was on syndicated TV and like, that's you know, funny. They, like, yeah. like, so like yeah. that was considered I, an excused absence. Yeah. <laughs> they, it was, just, I never went to school like I, in my school career, hardly. And, um, and I was willing, I told him straight up, I'm like, look, this is what I'm going to do for a living. I'm not going to go to college. So either you guys work with me while I'm doing this and help me, or I'm going to drop out of school. And my principal, they were like, well, he's got his mindset. So I tried to do the best I could with keeping up, you know, with my grades and all that stuff. And yeah, I think I missed 75 days my senior year. Wow. But I still got my diploma. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> the school year around here is only 180 days. So, yeah, was, you know, that was, was a crazy that was kind of, of a lot. The, the principal said, yeah, we'll get you your diploma. Just give me tickets to the right. <laughs> WWE yeah. yeah, show. Yeah, the, this, give me tickets to Monday Nitro. <laughs> they were super supportive, though, because me, Matt, and Jeff, we all went through the same high school. So oh, by okay. that point, like Matt and Jeff, they were doing, you know, spot work for WWE. So they were seeing them do that. So like they knew we were taking this thing for real. Like we wasn't just kind of bullshit them on, you know, like this is why I'm missing school because of this professional wrestling thing. Um, and then, you know, from there, like I was out in Music City wrestling and then I was out there for about a year and like I was doing good. I was making good money out there too and from a merchandise standpoint. And like just I was doing pretty well for myself out there. And then I just kind of got tired of driving nine hours every weekend like, you know, me and Shane Helms, we were going right. out together. Mm -hmm. That's um, right. That's right. Yeah. Shane was in the crew. Was he in the crew with, early with you guys, with Matt and Jeff? Yeah, he come, whenever Omega come about, like, that's whenever that's when Shane, came Shane really started. Like, um, and that, you had Joey Matthews and Christian York in that too, right? Yeah, Christian York. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It was part of the North Carolina yeah. crew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had such a big crew, man, that split off and everybody went and did some amazing things, man. Like, um, I was grateful just to have all those guys in my life and part of my you know, just part of my career because like, I, I think that's why we were able to be successful in the industry was because like we all had the same passion and drive going back to what we were just talking about. Right. That's, that's, uh, that's, so Music City, that was, um, they, they were running like a terror. They were kind of, was they one of the like territory where they running a couple days a week? Yeah, that was, I would say that's probably one of your last territories. The last territory. Yeah, like that's what Memphis, I was thinking. Memphis and yeah. Music City. Yeah, Music City was, you know, right there in Nashville. And then you had Memphis still going at the time. And, um, God, I went, I started going out there, I think 16, 16, whenever 16 or 17, somewhere in that ballpark. And, um, you know, I stayed out there for a while and was just, you know, like, it really like that's where I feel like my career kind of went into that next level of you know like understanding the business, right? You know, and that was Burt Prentice, right? Yeah, it was Bill Barons and Burt Prentice. Bill ba and Burt passed away, didn't he? Yeah, he just recently passed recently away. passed yeah, away yeah. a few months ago. Yeah, yeah. Bill's still Bill's still doing great. Oh, yeah, still he is. <laughs> yeah. He's been God. He he was my agent since I was fifteen. Mm -hmm. Right. So like right. he did a lot of agent stuff for me um, over the years. Uh, but yeah, Bill's great, man. Like I owe a lot to Bill. He, um, you know, like Bert was cool, but Bill was like my wrestling dad, if you will. Yeah. Um, he's got yeah. a lot of kids. Yeah, he does. He's, yeah. He's uh. He's an attorney, isn't he? Is he an attorney? Um, or no, no? He's, no, he's not. I thought attorney. he was a. He's one of the first guys I ever dealt with that was like an agent mm -hmm. for yeah. people. Um, one of the first guys that kind of started using them. But you know what? He's always been really good. Yeah. yeah. There's some guys that do this stuff. And you, for me, too, like after 30 years doing, I'm like, I just like to talk to the guys direct. You yeah, know what I right. mean? Like I've been yeah. doing this 30 years. 
But um, because some guys are just jerks that try to do like to handle the third parties. But Mm -hmm. Bill's always been. Yeah, he's been really cool, man. He's a he's a real easy guy to deal with. I actually really like dealing with Bill. He's real easy to deal with. Yeah, I feel like he's he handles himself in a professional manner. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't you know, he's fair. Yeah. I think he's fair for all parties, and I feel like that's one thing because that's something that I, you know, like I look at, and I've always tried to look at my uh, over the years too. Is like, I don't want to come in and like have an agent or somebody negotiate and try to hit somebody in the head and take this big lump sum that they're not gonna get what they invested in me back. Right. Because like I want to, I want to continue these relationships, and you know, not only is it a business relationship, but I feel like going back to family. Like, man, this is my family. Like, I don't have family. I don't have a mother or father or a bunch of brothers and sisters, you know. So, like, I feel like the wrestling community, like, I've I've never met anybody that I really don't like in the wrestling industry. You know, yeah. there's only a couple of people that I've crossed <laughs> paths with where I'm like, yeah, stay away from them. <laughs> right. But, like, I just feel like this is my family. And, like, I always, you know, I don't want to just do business once. Mm-hmm. It's like, I want to be part of your family. It's like, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, that's just the way I've always looked at it. And I feel like Bill kind of understood what I wanted out of my career. Yeah, and him being a promoter, I think, too, he understands it. Because sometimes, and and even still nowadays, you get, it. there's some guys that are just, like, price gouging, like, just way too much. Like, and they'll, you know, like, man, that's just what they're asking. It's just, like, not possible. You know, yeah. we're right. a small indie show, and now we're we're even going through things now where we can see ticket sales tightening up you know you're hearing about inflation Mm -hmm. and everything prices going up on everything like we can see it you know me and dennis have been talking about it like yeah we can see people starting to pull back you know Mm -hmm. um because the prices are going up so when you 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 know it's we're not freaking wwe or aew and we're not getting you know twenty thousand people or have billions of dollars so you kind of sometimes you guys are just, you know, they push the envelope too much. And it's like, man, you, but Bill understands that. I think that helps yeah. that he, he was a promoter, he, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, like, God, man, like, I think it helps too. Cause like we've ran shows, like I've been part of the process of running shows before. And, you know, for somebody to recoup their money, it's like, you know, you hear some guys like wanting 10 grand to come in and do a, do a show for somebody. And it's like, like who can, who can afford to pay 10 yeah. grand? Right. Like, right. dude, like, you know, it would take an, a WWE roster to draw that many people to recoup the money. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, even if you look at the WWE house shows, like, you know, they're not drawing tons of people. And, you know, right. they got all that talent that's on TV every week. So what makes you think that you can charge 10 grand? You know, like, I, there, there's a handful of guys, I think, in the world that... A handful, yeah. A handful. We, we, we brought a couple to, of them yeah. in. We brought a couple of them. <laughs> like, right. we had Goldberg and you know, Shawn Michaels Shawn a couple Michaels of times. Yeah. And Rey Mysterio, Rey but, Mysterio. but, you know, yeah. we also had, you know, a thousand people here, you know what I mean? Yeah. With 400 of them in line for autographs. So, like, you know, for the guys that... But and that was a couple of years ago where there was like you said like these select few guys that had that big price tag. But with the big price tag, we, you know, like okay, well they're drawn. But now it's like a lot, of, and it it's saying like I well, a lot of guys they'll reach out to me and I'll be like, dude, I I can't pay you that man. Yeah. Like my whole show costs twelve or thirteen grand. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. you know what I mean? Like and I, you know so I can't I can't you know like yeah it's it's a lot of guys throwing that type of price out now and it's just. Like they're like what I'm like no that's there's just no way I can yeah. pay you that kind yeah. of money. It's just and there's a possible. handful of people like you said that can can charge like if the Undertaker calls you up, please tell him yes. Yeah. But yeah. um, you know because like uh, that's the thing, our fans they're loyal and they're faithful and they've been coming to see us for 20 years, but they can't put out three hundred dollars for a VIP autograph package right. every single show. But like they will when you bring in you know once or twice you know like every now and then but like we we run shows regularly you know we're we're in the middle of we got like six shows in six weeks so you know we can't we can't do stuff like that but well i think it goes back to man like if you think about you know like i i started you know like if you want to call it indies or just outlaw shows or whatever (laughs) from back in the day like that's where i started so like i don't feel like today especially like somebody that goes to the wwe model like especially through NXT, like they've never been part of that. So they don't understand like the hustle aspect behind somebody that puts on a good show and like what it takes and the investment out of pocket for the promoter just, and you know, they're building their brand too. And it's like, 
you know, they're, you're on a budget. And it's like, just because you're a part of this machine that, you know, they send you your check every Monday, you better collect that because whenever you leave there, like if you don't know how the how indie the scene works, works right. mm-hmm. and I think that's why a lot of guys fall off and you don't hear from them and they don't do nothing but once every, you know, right. eight months or six months because yeah. they don't know how. They're not educated on what it takes to be able to make a living doing something outside of the WWE model. And it's funny you say that because a lot of the guys that will that reach out to me and, and they're like that where I can look and go, okay, this guy was never on the indies. They were from like the performance center and they, yeah. put, you know what I mean? I've had a, a couple recently in the last couple months and they throw these crazy prices, five, six, eight thousand. You know, and I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like what? You know? And that's, yeah. And I'm, same thing then and then you look around i'm like i don't see him on any shows and that's why Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. you know i'm trying to get work and get out there well like not at that price tag buddy yeah right. you know (laughs) you know well i mean if you take a step back like me i try to take a step back and go okay like legitimately like if this was just me and they were promoting just me like is enough people gonna show up to pay for me right you know what i mean like and that's the way I try to look at it because, like, and I don't know, maybe I undercut myself or maybe I, that's why, like, I don't have millions of dollars in the bank. I don't know. But I just think, you know, like, I don't know, man. Like, I I want a, I want a long career. And yeah. so far, like, it's worked out for me to where, you know, I've almost been wrestling, what, 29 years almost. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy, um, isn't it? And it's, you know, and still, like, this weekend, like, I'm nonstop. Like, I can wrestle as much as I want or as least as I want. It just depends yeah. on how busy I want to be with my other projects going, too. So Right. So, and you, you got to, and you, but you get it. I think, you know, you understand it. And th- there are some promoters that you can get that from and people that pop up in comic cons that you can, but, but you understand that. And it's really just kind of understanding how, kind of how the whole thing works. How yeah. How indies work. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to take a quick break for Internet Station Identification, but we're going to be right back here with our special in-studio guest, Shannon Moore. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the MCW Cast. At MCW Pro Wrestling, much like many small businesses throughout the country, the pandemic has presented many challenges. For a company like ours that hosts events with live audiences, the impact has been even more severe, and all of our forms of revenue have been cut off. In order to continue to engage with our fans on a regular basis, we made the decision to begin to produce the MCW cast and are providing it for absolutely no cost on Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube, and SoundCloud. If you'd like to support us during these challenging times, you can do so in several ways. The most popular way is to buy us a coffee to help fuel the cast. Just go to buymeacoffee.com backslash MCW cast and for just $3, you can buy the cast a coffee or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just $5 a month and receive several special perks. That's buymeacoffee.com backslash MCWcast. You can also contribute directly on Cash App, MCW Wrestling, or on Venmo, MCW Wrestling. You can also show your support for the MCW cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com backslash stores backslash MCWcast to pick up a full line of official MCW cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to t-shirts and sweatshirts. Also, don't forget to comment in the threads on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch to get your questions answered on a future episode. And you can also send us a tweet using the hashtag AskMCWCast. Thank you for your support. And now, back to the show. All right, we are back with our guest, Shannon Moore. Uh, I want to go back to, you had just briefly touched on it, but back in 1999 when you signed with WCW, um, you became a part of Three Count, and that was like a boy band parody type group. And I wanted to know, um, was that an idea that you came up with, and was that because you had always been interested in music? or Because I know you've you, you've done your own entrance music, you've been in a band and so forth like that. Is that how that came together? or? Yeah, actually, no, it just, Jimmy Hart is the one, he's the brains behind Three Count. Um, You know, in Nashville, I touched on Nashville for Music City Wrestling. Like, we were kind of doing a boy band type, we were called the Bad Street Boys um, back then uh, in Music City Wrestling. And Chris Canyon, he's the one who uh, ended up getting me hired. Wow. Um, And ultimately, like, rumor has it, like, I've never had the discussion with Eric, but they were going to hire 21 cruiserweights and put them in a house together and like film it like a real world type 
uh, I don't know if you remember real well. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. That's um, our generation. That's our yeah. 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 We remember it. I'm old. Sorry. <laughs> right. nah, um, but yeah, they were going to film it. I, from what I hear, like the real world and watch, you know, like these 21 cruiserweights kind of evolve in WCW in this house living amongst each other. But huh. that kind of got scrapped. And um, like I was one of the first that was hired for that idea. And then Shane went down from whenever I did my they hired me and sent me a contract never see me wrestle live like basically wcw did and then wow. shane went down whenever they finally called like hey maybe we need to see you wrestle live now and see uh see what you're all about um so shane went down they ended up hiring him but um but yeah from there like you know i sit home for a couple of months just getting paid they sent us down to the power plant and me and shane were down there for like a week and we were both like, dude, we've been doing this a little bit too long to be here getting knocked out mm -hmm. like by guys that, you know, don't know what they're doing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I got a bad concussion while I was down there, like on day three. So me and Shane were like, you know what, we're going to go into Paul Orndorff's office and we're going to tell him that we're going home. And, you know, like you heard rumors about Paul. It's like yeah. we didn't know. Like and we talked about it. We're like, dude, we're probably going to have to fight him. And I was like, you know, like, how do you want to handle this? Like, what if he grabs a knife or <laughs> all we heard? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we heard stories plans. about, yeah, he was <laughs> like, Paul was supposed to be really tough. And like, he was you know, apparently crazy whenever it comes to like fighting and stuff. So we were prepared and we went in and we told him and um, he was like, ah, oh, I don't know why you're here anyways. Like, yeah, go home. And we're <laughs> going, okay, like, where's the punchline here? Like, you know, we're waiting on it. And he, that's all he said. And we were like, okay, cool. We're going home. So we went home. And then uh, I think immediately, um, like two or three days later, Jimmy Hart called me. He's like, um, hey, baby, like, what are you doing? Like, you're on the to-be-fired list now. Like, oh, really? That, oh. Yeah, so, like, it was a complete, like, you know, like, here, you know, yeah, go home. Watch this. I'm going to fire, you know, like, just a dick move, like, that this was happens. pulling. Yeah. That happens in wrestling. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, yeah, typical. That, typical. Carny ass. Carny like, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but Jimmy, he saved the day, man. Jimmy scooped in and he made sure that, you know, they kept me and Shane. And uh, I think that's whenever Jimmy was like, hey, you know, we're going to form this boy band. You know, Britney Spears is hot. Uh, Justin Timberlake's hot. We're going to do this thing. We're going to tour and you guys are going to play in shopping malls. And like, he had this baby face outlook like we were going to be as big as Britney and like Justin. <laughs> right. Like, for real. Like he thought that we were going to be a legit boy band. Like, yeah. Wow. And we actually, we went, I think it was, it was to the Backstreet Boys studio uh, in Tampa. It was either Backstreet Boys or NSYNC. Um, it was one of their studios in Tampa where they did their music. And um, we recorded the songs. And like I can't sing, like <laughs> not good at all. Like it was just like, Terrible. and then like Shane's rapping, and uh, you know like Evans trying to sing, and it's like I'm just going like, man, this this is good. <laughs> Jimmy's going, this is great. This is the greatest thing ever. Have a yeah. musical background? No, like other than like playing like rock music. Okay, like, you know jamming on a guitar, right, like, right. where you can just scream. Okay, uh, but actually singing a tune like <laughs> no absolutely not and um but jimmy man like he was so like behind it and he thought that it was going to be the the greatest like baby face thing ever in my head i'm going man i don't want to be a pop band i want to be a rock star like i've yeah. always uh -huh. you know this is the way i've always wanted to look and um he's like you know like you're gonna be the you know the biggest pop band ever and like he believed in this thing and i was like okay like if you believe in it i guess i believe that it <laughs> But then, it, you know, like the girls liked us and the guys hated us and it become like more of a hill act than anything. And it's like Arn Anderson would send us out. Man, he would send us out probably four times a show because the people just wanted to see us die. Like he right. would sit, we'd open the show singing and the people would boo a little bit like they'd be booing. <laughs> then he'd send us out right before intermission. And then he'd send us out after intermission. <laughs> and then by the time it would, you know, like semi-main event, like after that, like he'd send us out before the main. And like by that point, people would be throwing shit at us and we'd be using our green circles as shields, like ducking, trying to like not get hit with water bottles. And then like they would send Sid Vicious out and Sid would slowly walk down the aisle and the people would start like slowly like cheering. Like they were booing us, but then you would hear these cheers start like making its way toward the ring. And then, you know, we'd be like, oh, we knew you guys would get it. Like, you know, thank you. Thank you for having us tonight. We knew you would finally understand we're the greatest boy band ever. 
and it was just Sid. Like they knew Sid was about ready to kill yeah. us. Yeah. Then he would just stand behind us for a minute, and then like we'd turn around, and he'd just destroy us and send us on our way. And like the people just they loved it, man. So yeah. we did that for months, and yeah. you know, then we had our matches with the Young Dragons and stuff, where we actually showed like, hey, we can wrestle too. Like, yeah, this is a cheesy act for you guys to boo, but you know, here's what we can really do. Yeah. So I think the two kind of made it work. What? Go ahead. Oh, uh, no. You know what just made me think of? Do you remember? This had to have been a couple years after that. We did that thing in D.C., and it was a there was a boy band. What was it like O Town or something? Uh, yeah, and we O-Town. did wrestling like in between their sets. Do yes. you remember that? that I, like, do remember, I just remember that. When just you thinking that about that, I was like, wow. So that was a real thing. Like those two <laughs> things somehow in the late nineties, early two thousands. That was went like a together. paid gig that they had us do. I, I totally forgot about that. that I was, it was right after my neck surgery, so I like was early on like MCW days. Yeah. I was refereeing. <laughs> I don't remember. It was kind of blurry, but I remember yeah. we'd have some matches, and then O Town would take the stage and play. And yeah, and then we do a couple. And we do a couple more that, yeah. matches. It's it was crazy. I totally forgot about yep. it. it was like the DC Convention Center. It was. It nice. was. But that was right around this era. So that must have been a thing, you know, where yeah. they thought yeah. these you, two things go together. When you started doing that in Music City, Joey, were Joey and Christian a part of that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They were part of the, the Bad Street Boys. Thing. Gotcha. That's what I thought. That's what yeah. I remember. And they got hired, too, uh, eventually for to be one of the 21 of the Cruiserweights, too, in WCW. It's just whenever they realized that they wasn't going to go through with whatever idea Eric had in mind for that reality show or whatever it was, they started chopping people. Yeah, I think that's whenever those guys kind of. I, and I don't want to speak for Joey and Christian, but I think I remember them too. Like they were kind of sitting home. I remember them saying like they were kind of sitting home waiting, and they didn't get any direction. And then they just like yeah got cut kind of like you said there was no direction. Just like yeah. you're signed and like are we, what are we supposed to do and. Yeah, yeah. I like, guess they didn't go down to the power plant or whatever. And yeah, they. I, I mean, we were on the doom list too. But right. Jim, Jimmy saved us, man. Like yeah. Jimmy. Yeah, I love Jimmy. He's had a big part of my career, like impact on my career. Was he involved in Music City? Um, no, or? not Music City. You just City. got to know him in WCW. Yeah. yeah, and he took a liking to you. Yeah, like yeah. he just he believed in us. He's like, you guys are young, pretty, you know, guys. Like the women are gonna love you. Like he just he kn- he knows wrestling, man. He knows what sells, and he's like. Mm-hmm. At that point, we were so young and different from everybody else on the roster, and he just thought that it would it would be so different that it would be good for a roster. Whatever happened to Evan? Dude, he's doing great. I talk to him all the time. Um, yeah, he's one. Of, he's a good friend of mine still, and uh, I talk to him weekly. He's got a um, a tax business in Charlotte, North Carolina, a huge tax business. Gotcha. Like, he did well for himself once he left WWE. Like he opened yeah. this big business and. Oh, so he's, he's not doing him. wrestling at all anymore. Nah, he's he's he does like a few signings, I think, here and there. Um, but he doesn't venture in the ring or nothing no more. Like he just takes care of his business and I guess living living life. So you bring up that uh, Jimmy Hart kind of saved y'all from the chopping block when you know the power plant was a thing. Fast forward to two thousand and one, uh, and WWE purchases WCW, and then you landed in Heartland Wrestling. Yeah. So it's kind of like back to the drawing board of like have proven yourself and been on, you know, national TV. But with that deal, you kind of found yourself right back in kind of a developmental, but now the WWE's how, how'd that feel when you were there, but like not on TV immediately back to like the Ohio valleys. Yeah. It, I mean, it didn't really bother me. I knew, well, I was just happy to have a job, honestly, like at that point. Cause you know, like that last day in WCW, like that last show, man, like it was like, you know, what's our fate? Mm. you know like oh, so you were on that last night yeah i was yeah. on the last night i wrestled on that show and like it was just such an awkward moment and i was like man am i gonna see any of my friends anymore and i remember flying home like going oh man what what's gonna happen and um you know finally johnny ace called me and he's like hey you got a meeting with jr i think it was in atlanta and i'll never forget it because i probably prob- the reason i probably ended up in heartlands because like they booked my flight to go meet jr and my dumb ass like missed the flight and oh. my first meeting with Jr. Oh like goodness, yeah. about what they're gonna do with me. Yeah. Like I missed my flight and didn't oh. make the meeting, so I, I got there late. And then it was just like I walked in and I was like, "Hey, sorry, you know." And he's like, "This phone ring." And it was Mick Foley. I'll never forget it. And he's like, "You know Mick Shannon?" And I was like, "Yeah, he's a hell of a guy." And I was like, "Yeah, he is." And then he just talked to Mick, and then he's <laughs> like, "Yeah, you're gonna be a good cruiserweight for us." Like, oh, "Glad you came." And then right. he, like pushed me out. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah and then i you know i sit home for a while i was home for i don't know probably two months and i was like man i need to be in the ring 
need to be doing something. And I think um, I reached out to somebody that was going to do a European tour and Blue Meanie and Jasmine St. Clair were going to be on the tour, I think. And, um, you know, I, I was going to be on that tour with them just to go get some ring work, you know, in Europe. So I contacted JR and I'm like, hey, you know, do you mind if I go to this tour? And he's like, oh, let me call you back. And I was like, all right. And he's like, hey, well, we're just starting up this company called, you know, or we're going to turn HWA into our developmental territory because Memphis is shutting down. And we want you to go there for a few weeks. I'm like, all right, great. So I packed up for a couple of weeks and ended up staying a year. And, oh, wow. Uh, you were wow. down there a year. Yeah. Yeah, because I had my house and, I, you know, I already established life, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in North Carolina. And right. um, then I packed up my car for two weeks and I was engaged at the time. And I was like, I'll be back in two weeks. Don't worry. Oh. And I was there for a year, man. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Were you still engaged at the end of the year? <laughs> Barely. Yeah. <laughs> Barely. Well, then... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I ended up marrying her, but it was out of guilt. <laughs> Oh. For that year, no. right? <laughs> well, good she stuck around. Yeah, for just that. No, she's a great you know. lady. Like, yeah. <laughs> not everybody yeah. would, yeah. you know. No, definitely not, man. <laughs> so that that last uh, that last nitro, I guess it really was kind of like you, you hear about, like they WWE just kind of came in and like that's when you guys all found out. Is that when w, everybody on the roster found out like WWE is, was buying you that day? Yeah, dude, I I had no clue, man. Like I, you know, and at the time too, like I was more. I guess like just living my dream and like focus on the wrestling aspect and like trying to come up with ideas and stuff like that. Like I never really ventured into the business and never got lost in like the gossip and all that stuff. Yeah. So like it really caught me off guard because like, you know, I walked in and just there's a sign that said WWE this way and then WCW that way. And I was like, I thought what? it was a rib. I'm like, all right, who's who's messing around? And then I went the, the WCW way and went in the catering room and then it's like that's here when you we go. Find got out, the big yeah. meeting. Yeah, we had the big meeting. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, that must have been a harrowing day. I can only <laughs> imagine what it was like to see those two signs. Like you go this way, you go that way. I got a quick question. I remember when WWE acquired WCW and there was all this talk. I was the infancy of the internet. It was like you know a couple of the guys. WWE bought out their contracts and kind of pretty much put their like, hey, we're, we want you, the rest of you guys stay home and, and your contract will ride out. But what I want to take you back to was that WrestleMania 17, I think it was, there were a few WCW guys all the way up at the top of whatever that arena was. And Shane McMahon kind of says, I want to say hi, shout out to all my WCW guys up there. And you really couldn't make out who was up there. There were figures, but it wasn't zoomed in. I think Stacy Keebler was there. And I feel like I read on the internet, you were one of the guests up there. Was that? No, nah, well, I wasn't there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. I wasn't on, on that initial shot whenever they did that. Like I was probably sitting in Cincinnati. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just watch it from home. Yep. Yeah. Something I always wondered, because like I said, it was the infancy of the internet, and they were like uh, Sean Stasiak, a few, few uh, Stacy Keebler, and like I said, when they showed everyone up there, I remember I was like, "Is that Rey Mysterio?" Like yeah. trying to figure out who those wrestlers were because it wasn't out who WWE had acquired and and said, "You guys are coming with us." But we were all waiting with bated breath to see whoever popped up and. Eventually, it was Booker T and uh, Marcus Alexander Bagwell. But, yeah, I always wanted to ask that. And since yeah. you're a guest on the cast, I can ask you face-to-face. -face. Yeah. It was cool. You know what? HWA was awesome. Like, it was one of the best years of my life, honestly. And you were with Evan down there. Yeah, Evan was there. Um, Umaga was there. Charlie oh, wow. Haas. Like, we had a good crew there, man. And, you know, like, I guess I never went to college, right? So, like, that year, I feel like, was my college yeah. years. Cause, wow. like, yeah. I was um, – and I think whenever it comes to psychology and like wrestling, like that's how, where I feel like I really evolved. Cause like, man, we were, you know, we did three, four hour training sessions a day. And then like we worked and we did two, three, four shows a week. Like we were, you know, whether it was in-house shows, but it was, you know, fans there and like, you know, working that much every week for that year. Like I really got to understand like how to listen to the people and like how, you know, not to go out there and just make it about move sets. Like, actually, try to draw these people in emotionally, and um, it was a it was a good learning year for me. Who it was less was that Les Thatcher? Yeah, Les Thatcher oh, was right. awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I had forgot about HWA. So it went from Memphis to them. Yeah. Then to OVW. Is that um, kind? Of yeah, Memphis to HWA, and then HWA to yeah. Okay. Well, OVW was going on too during this time like, they were simultaneous was, they yeah. were simultaneous mm -hmm. yeah. hard to remember yeah, yeah. yeah it was because we would go down and we would film our tv product at the ovw 
studios down in Louisville. Oh, gotcha. Um, so that's where, you know, we'd go back and forth, but our training facility was there. And how'd they let you know that you were getting called up, like up to the, 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 the SmackDown year? Um, it was about a year, you know, close to a year into it. Um, like I had some of the best cruiserweight matches I've ever had in my life in that tape library. Like, I don't know who owns that or if Les still has it or who has that, those oh, tapes. Oh, Vince doesn't own it? That stuff's never been on the I'm network. I'm not sure. Right? Yeah, it's never been on the network. Oh, wow. But, like, me and Jamie Noble, um, BJ Whitmer. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. dude, we had a year of, like, good, solid cruiserweight feuds that, like, were phenomenal. And, like, I hope someday, like, they do make their way to – the network, the network so or, yeah. people can enjoy them because like I, i'm curious to go back and watch it myself but every once in a while somebody will send me a video like a home video of like some of the matches i'm like man that's those are lost tapes like this you know got a lot of bumps and bruises on it what did bj have a full head of hair back then uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Long, beautiful hair man yeah. i want to see that yeah. <laughs> i only know buzz cut bj really from uh the late roh days but yeah, yeah. i would I'd love to sink my teeth in those. Maybe Chad Austin yeah. has some of those yeah, volumes, you know, with his you. tape library. Yeah, like Chad he, Collier. Do y'all know Chad Collier? Mm -mm. Yeah. I heard the name. Yeah, it's like he was me, him, Jamie Noble, and BJ. Like we pretty much, like for a year, just had this long feud that was, and another guy, Matt Stryker. Um, but yeah, yeah. they're pretty awesome mm -hmm. tapes. Right on. We so, got another break we got to go to or? Yeah, we actually should probably yeah, pause one more time right for internet now, station actually. identification. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. But mm -hmm. stick with us here on the MCW yeah. cast. We'll be right back with Shannon Moore. We hope you're enjoying this week's episode of the MCW cast at MCW pro wrestling, much like many small businesses throughout the country. The pandemic has presented many challenges for a company like ours that hosts events with live audiences. The impact has been even more severe and all of our forms of revenue have been cut off. In order to continue to engage with our fans on a regular basis, we made the decision to begin to produce the MCW cast and are providing it for absolutely no cost on Facebook Live, Twitch, YouTube, and SoundCloud. If you'd like to support us during these challenging times, you can do so in several ways. The most popular way is to buy us a coffee to help fuel the cast. Just go to buymeacoffee.com backslash MCWcast and for just $3, you can buy the cast a coffee or you can choose to become a member of the cast for just $5 a month and receive several special perks. That's buymeacoffee.com backslash MCWcast. You can also contribute directly on Cash App, MCW Wrestling, or on Venmo, MCW-Wrestling. You can also show your support for the MCW cast while sporting some great gear by going to teespring.com backslash stores backslash MCWcast to pick up a full line of official MCW cast merchandise from coffee mugs and face coverings to t-shirts and sweatshirts. Also, don't forget to comment in the threads on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch to get your questions answered on a future episode. And you can also send us a tweet using the hashtag AskMCWCast. Thank you for your support. And now, back to the show. And we are back on the MCW cast. And uh, I guess something we should kind of touch on um, today is uh, the one year anniversary of indeed the passing of the bruiser. Mm -hmm. um, and he was kind of the reason um, after he passed, we started this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things RJ was really open about and talked about that was a big part of his life was addiction and uh, probably more so his recovery. And a lot of people that he helped, um, people that I know that have struggled, and, and RJ, um, even, even while he was di even after he had, was diagnosed with leukemia and was going through, um, going through everything he was going through with cancer, um, that he would still always uh, check in on people that I had in my life that were mm -hmm. that were struggling with addiction. Um, he was kind of selfless like that, and uh, that's something you yourself. Um, have been in recovery and you're doing a lot uh, running a center, you know, and, and doing work with people, I guess, down in Florida. Yeah, man. Um, you know, like as you know, like everybody, I guess, even, you know, wrestling fans, like if you are on the Internet and all that stuff, like you realize, like, you know, pro wrestling is like a really, I guess, um, wear and tear business, if you will. Like, 
And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, like alcoholism and drug addiction over the past years that, you know, and it's getting better today, but you know, yeah, I had my own struggles, man. Um, and I ended up having to go into treatment, um, myself and it was the best decision I ever made because, you know, like until you're aware that you're struggling and you want to change, like you don't know. And it's like a lot of people have these issues and they just don't know. And it's, it's not that, you know, like they're, they're saying, you know, arguing the fact that, no, I'm not an alcoholic or a drug addict. It's just like, you're, you're sick. You're mentally sick whenever you're in active addiction. And, um, I think that's where I, I got to the point where I was physically addicted to stu substances and I had to have them in order to feel normal. And then, you know, like that was opiates at the time. And then once opiates become too expensive to get, like that's whenever I started venturing into heroin. Mm. And man, once, once I started, you know, like shooting heroin, like it took over my life. Like my life just crumbled. And, um, you know, I was fortunate, you know, to make it out alive. And once I went through the treatment process, you know, um, I come out on the other side and like, I realized like, man, like this is a real thing. Like it's, you know, at that time that was, you know, four years ago, I, I realized like, you know, where we're at in society, like drug addiction, alcoholism is, it touches probably every family, whether they're aware of it or not. Like somebody in each family is probably struggling in some way, whether it's mental illness, whether it's alcoholism or drug addiction. Um, and, you know, like my grandmother, she was an alcoholic and, you know, I had a brother that was a drug addict. And I used to tell myself, like, I'll, I'll never be a drug addict because we think about drug addicts like that's the person under the bridge that's mm -hmm. homeless, mm -hmm. you know, like that that has no money. Like that's a drug addict. Right. That's what we visualize being a drug addict. But it's not. It's yeah. doctors, it's lawyers, it's pro athletes, mm -hmm. it's it's anybody, it's moms, it's dads, yeah. it's daughters and sons. And that was the case for me is like I finally realized, like dude, you're a drug addict, like go to treatment, like you need help. And, um, you know, eventually like I reached out for help and, you know, like that's the first thing that you have to do is you ask, you have to ask for help. Like mm -hmm. I didn't know how to ask for help. I knew nothing about treatment. I knew nothing about addiction or alcoholism. I just knew that I didn't want to live that life no more. So I went through treatment, man. And whenever I come out of treatment, like I realized like, man, like it was so real. And I knew like in our industry, like I would be able to help some of the men and women in our industry. And if I could save one person and give them the gift that I got at that point, like that's what I needed to do. And that led to, you know, like the CEO of a company, like hiring me and give me an opportunity to work with, you know, not just athletes or, you know, wrestlers, but to work with doctors and lawyers. And mm -hmm. before you know it, like, you know, I helped a couple of people get sober and I'm like, man, like, what a great feeling. Like I helped somebody change their lives. So it just gave me a new purpose in life and it, it made me, you know, want to continue that journey. So, you know, today that's what I do. Like I'm a um, client care manager at Riverside Recovery in Tampa, Florida. Like I, I do that part time during the week. And that's what I do. I, I work with, you know, all walks of life now, like trying to help them get the gift of sobriety. Uh, that is very powerful. It that really is. That I, I'm a case manager um, for not at a recovery center, but I help people in recovery uh, go to college to become alcohol and drug counselors themselves. And so I'm their case manager. And I, the reason why I applied for that job was because of RJ. And yeah. he had gotten sick and he's, and I had, don't have a background in this, yeah. but he helped so many people and he was continuing that and he wasn't going to be able to continue it anymore. So literally, Two weeks before he passed, I applied for the job. And two weeks after he passed, I got the job. Nice. <laughs> and wow. But it's that, you know, I felt compelled to do something that he, you know, that and because that meant a lot to him. He, one of the reasons I think that he didn't seek treatment right away was because he didn't want to walk away from this business. So I don't know if you had to take a break or not. But for him, he, you know, in this business, when you walk away for any length of break, you can be forgotten about. Easily, and so that's yeah. a really big concern. And so I know for him, he didn't want to, he didn't want to step away. I mean, he was forced to step away for a little bit of time. Was that something you had to consider too? Like, yeah, I, you know, whenever, like I, I knew a year before, like I asked for help that I needed help, mm -hmm. but I was scared. I was scared because like, I, I didn't want, I didn't want to get blackballed like from the industry. Right. Like I didn't want people to look at me as a drug addict or an alcoholic because I did pretty well hiding my addiction. Right. 
And I was like, man, like everybody's going to label me. Like I'm not going to get work. Like nobody will want me on their shows if I go to treatment. But after a while, like my life was so bad. I couldn't exist. I couldn't get on a plane and fly anywhere because like I, I needed like that's by the end, like I had a thousand dollar a day habit. And it's like, I, I had to have so much, like a larger amount of drugs a day. It was impossible for me to jump on a plane and fly to Baltimore and show up and be normal. Cause by the time I got here, I'd be so sick that like, y'all would be like, dude, are you, you going to make it? Like, right. Because right. that's, that was my daily routine. Yeah. It was just like, wake up and try to survive and just feel normal. Mm -hmm. Um, so as far by that point, like I didn't care. Like I knew at that point it's either I'm going to end up in prison. I'm going to end up dead or I'm going to get help. And, you know, like, um, road dog, Ryan James, man, mm -hmm. like, you know, he's my boy. I reached out to help from him and, uh, he's like, dude, like, just do it. Like, like go to treatment. We're going to get you in treatment. Like, you know, WWE, let us, let us try to send you to treatment and just let's get you better and let's get you back happy. And like, at that point, like I just made the decision, like nothing else mattered. Like it was about me getting healthy and me becoming happy again and everything else would fall into place. Right. And that's, you know, that's exactly what happened. Like, I, you know, I focused, once I got out of treatment, like I was wrestling some while I was in treatment. Once I got healthy enough, like oh. I did a few shows while I was mm -hmm. in treatment. And then whenever I got out, like the, you know, I ended up doing uh, coaching at NXT for, you know, a year. And that was, you know, like, so nobody looked down on me. Like every, right. everybody was like, dude, I'm proud of you. Like everybody, you know, like, they pushed me and like, they, they were glad that I got help. Mm -hmm. So like, that's the thing is I, I think everybody's got this, you know, this thing created in their head. Like if I ask for help or if I go to treatment, everybody's going to look down on me or I'm going to get blackballed or nobody's going to touch me. And it's like, man, if you're listening, ask for help, take care of yourself. Like people will like love you for helping yourself and nobody will take opportunities from you because that, that and that's my story and like i i don't think that you can't look down on somebody for trying to better themselves right. and it's right. like if you if you own a company and you're gonna bash somebody for going to treatment and trying to better their lives it's like i probably shouldn't be working for you anyways right right because right. you're you're probably a <laughs> bang you right. know what i mean like yeah. it, like really yeah and you know you can't you just can't look down on somebody for trying to save their own life and trying to better their life so like mm -hmm. if you're out there ask for help nobody's going to look down on you yeah. and and if you're and if you're a family member or friend cuz that's one of the things me and Tara had talked about mm -hmm. for so long cuz not only you know in a recent situation with um someone I'm close with that was struggling with it but through Axel you know right. Axel Rod yep. who was my trainer um, who was very open about it and, and, and he got to where he, he died from it. Well, he, he was, he got, he thought he was getting heroin, but he ended up getting straight fentanyl, um, and, and overdosed. But, um, I watched it for years and my father died of alcoholism. So like, you know, when you're touched by it, um, and you're a family member or friend that's, that's touched by it, um, it, it really is a family disease where it, yeah. it, it infects everyone close to you, yeah. you know, the, the person that's, that's in addiction infects, you know, it, it infects everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, it's something that's, it's one of those things that I've, you know, gotten older and more mature. And maybe when I was younger and I know I used to have, my dad, you know, died of addiction when I was like 25 and I was angry for years. And I think that's something too there, you know, for people to understand and be educated that it's, that it is a sickness. Right. Yeah. And it is a disease. But you're right. Like for the, the people in my life now that when they they go to treatment um, and they get help, man, I am so proud of them. Yeah. It is, you know what I mean? And yeah. it is that like you're saying, it's the, the people that understand have been touched by it. When someone pulls it together, it's it's such an awesome feeling for them. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Well, well one thing that's oh, sorry. One thing that's always been lacking is kind of that family support. You had mentioned mm -hmm. that, you know, it's a disease that affects families and like. Um, I had said my job, like we're the only program in the state of Maryland that is specifically, it's the Opioid Impacted Family Support Program. And it is the only one in the whole state of Maryland 
that looks at not just the person with addiction, but the family as well. And it's like there's I feel like our healthcare system in general has a disconnect. You know, like each of our body parts are insured differently. Your teeth right, are different. Right, your head yeah. is different. Your body is different. But, you know, when dealing with this, that part, the family part seems to have been removed from the equation. And yeah. it's like when you kind of envelop that the whole the whole unit, then, you know, people, not only would the person in recovery have a better outcome, but, you know, the family can start to understand and process some of the stuff that took place. Yeah. Well, because yeah. there's like a PTSD for and the family yeah, members. Yeah. There really absolutely. is like a PTSD that you go through, you know, while the, the person in addictions in recovery, yeah. mm -hmm. you yourself as the close family are going through this PTSD of like, oh my God, what yep. happened? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, it, it, it's, it affects the family. It affects everybody around you and mm -hmm. like, and hard, like you, and you don't realize it. Like I didn't realize like how mm -hmm. it affected my friends or my family or my girlfriend, like until, you know, like we started doing the family sessions and, yep. you know, the family started getting involved and like my girlfriend was actually talking to a therapist that was on site and like, man, you, you now looking back, it's like, I realized like, man, I was, I was a horrible person, but I was sick. Mm -hmm. And like whenever you're going through active addiction and alcoholism, like you're sick. Like mm -hmm. the people, the individual is a sick person. Like it's just like they have something else, you know, another, you know, you put a disease in there. It's, they're right. sick. Yeah. And um, I, I think that that's what the family doesn't understand. And until you educate them and it's good that they have that, yeah. you know, like being able to educate the family now on what it is yeah. that they're actually dealing with, not only while they're in treatment, but when they come home. Right. Because, you know, there's a big readjustment whenever they come home to, you know, yeah. how things are, how you support somebody or mm -hmm. how you, you know, what you're going to get when they come home, right. you know. And yeah. if anyone's in that, if anyone out there listening is in that, Al-Anon, um, there's mm -hmm. Al-Anon meetings, which are for um, family members and friends yeah. of, of mm -hmm. addicts. And there was also a great book that I was referred to called um, Codependent No More. Mm -hmm. yeah, about codependency yeah. and it was really good and helpful because what it explains is when you're when you're really close to someone in active addiction they can almost they make you sick and they yeah. can make yeah. you sick you almost <laughs> yeah. become codependent on them mm -hmm. trying to save them and mm -hmm. it kind of it teaches you a lot so if you're someone out there you've struggled um, that was a great book and eye-opening but Al-Anon meetings were also really good as well yeah. So. And if you think you have a, you know, an issue or know somebody with an issue, like contact me, man. You can get there a hold of me go. on yeah. Twitter. There you yeah. go. Like, yep. I'll, I'll, man, I, I go through my feeds every day and I've helped a lot of people that have heard my story and like I'm at the Shannon brand on Twitter. Contact me on Twitter, like reach out, man. Like, you know, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll call you. I'll do whatever I got to do. If you think you're struggling, like you have to ask for help. That's what it is. It's about having the leadership courage to ask for help. But it, if only they knew how proud, you know, we would be of yeah. them for doing it. Yeah. I think that's what it is. It's the fear, uh, like you said, of being shame. You know, well, yeah. with, there's right? a yeah. huge issue with stigma. I mean, that's one of the things I work with mm -hmm. my students about all the time. Like one of their first research papers is actually about how stigmas create barriers to treatment, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and it, it's, you know, you get that in your head that oh well it was your choice to pick up a drink or a drug but once which is true but once you've done that and then the addiction sets in then it yeah. is an illness just like any other illness so I you know it's so. it's trying to get past that barrier and you know sometimes you get in your own way sometimes you know i mean i know like with rj he needed to go to treatment for years before he did but yeah. he wouldn't you know it was yeah. that prideful i am I am not that addict. That addict lives under the under the overpass. Yeah. You know, right, I'm not that right. person. Well, yeah. one day he became that person, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. but um, it's interesting because he did take some time off from wrestling. I mean, he kind of had to. He physically couldn't do it anymore. And he took some time off. And then when he came back, people didn't even recognize him. Oh, I didn't. And yeah, like you can hear we did a tribute show for him last year. And I insisted on this match with Gangrel being in there because you can literally hear the crowd go, who is that? Because they hadn't seen him. And it was his first appearance in like two and a half years or something it was after he'd been sober for a couple of years for a year and um he did that and then our fans that we have now don't know rj from 1999 like they know the last eight years here where he did have that kind of positive impact and he did help other people he helped some of the boys in the locker room helped some fans yeah you know and it was just that real full circle thing for him where he was able to redirect that and kind of go oh 
I can still be the bruiser, but I can be this version and yeah. I don't have to be the guy that, you know, throws a handful yeah. of pills down my throat, you know? And that's not, you know, like that's one of the hardest things. Like, like I, I feel like you battle whenever, you know, you, you're, you're in active addiction and you get help is like trying to figure out like, how, how do I still, how I'm, I'm still going to be me. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Like, um, and it took me a while and it's, you know, that's an odd, it's an odd feeling because you're trying to settle in and, you know, be the old you, but not be the old you right. and mm-hmm. you overthink it. And yeah. like, it's just weird, but it, you know, like it finally falls into place and you realize like, Hey, no, I still got my personality. Like I'm still a goofball or, you know, like I'm, I can still be an asshole at times. So, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, like it, you know, nothing changes just now. Like, man, like, you know, like I'm happy and I'm sober and like, just, man, I hope that anybody that's struggling can have the courage to ask for help so they can come out on the other side of that because mm-hmm. everybody deserves it. Like there's, God is tortured to live like that. It's exhausting. Yeah. You know, just the, the upkeep. I mean, it's yeah. just exhausting. I mean, as exhausting as it is for the family members that have to watch it or try to, you know, make sure that they're okay every day, it's just as exhausting, you know, to, to have to maintain that lifestyle. So it's probably kind of a relief to be like, okay, I don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can. Well, the potential, like, man, like, I feel like you you can't, like, untap potential whenever you're in active addiction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I look back and it's like, man, I, I did some great things in my career and, you know, I've built businesses and that was an active addiction. And I'm like, you know, sometimes I think like, man, what if I'd have been sober? Cause like, since I've been, you know, like not y- using any kind of substance to alter my mind, it's like, I feel like I'm tapping into all this potential and like, and I got all this, these projects and opportunities and all this great stuff going on in my life. And it's just, it's amazing. I just, you know, I feel like a lot of people cheat themselves like out of you know careers and a lot of stuff because their mind's so clouded yeah, yeah. um and like man I, I just want everybody to feel that just to be able to yeah. feel that happiness and be able to unlock that potential and grow mm-hmm. well first things first and that's getting the message out and i think yeah. you did just yeah. that right here on the mcw <laughs> yeah. cast so we want to thank you once again for, for sharing that us, yeah. yeah and also mm-hmm. we want to throw out there uh to anyone that may be struggling with anything Shannon Moore's got an open door, but we here at the MCW cast, we have an open door as well. You yep, can... absolutely. I'll throw my name out there. That's I know, right, yeah. I'm so anti-Twitter, but I swear to God, if you message me on there and it's especially about this, I will yeah. absolutely reply. Um, you know, that's one thing that this is near and dear to me. I mean, you know, RJ and I, our marriage didn't survive the recovery process, We were, but we became much better friends mm. and much closer yeah. separate, and mm-hmm. I was much more able to support him and be a role so for me this is near and dear i want to continue and help where you know because he's not here to to carry that on and it was important to him so like i said i did a whole mid-career change and you know because i want to help too that's right well with that said i think that's going to wrap up this edition of the mcw cast yeah again shannon thanks for joining us thank Thank you you. guys man we'll see you all here next tuesday at eight